Hello folks, I'm Andy Larson, local food systems and small farms educator for the University of Illinois Extension. As you have no doubt already concluded, there is a lot more to starting a small-scale farm business than just putting some seeds in the ground. There is this whole complex legal framework, financial framework, organizational steps that you have to complete in order to best protect the business that you're going through so much effort to try to create. This presentation in particular is going to deal with contracts, which are really a routine part of many Illinois farm businesses and lives for that matter. Think of loans, mortgages, grain marketing contracts. Today, however, we're going to be adapting this topic specifically for the beginning produce farmer and focusing our attention on a few different types of contracts which are likely to be, well, pretty important to this demographic, including sales contracts for marketing farm products, land leases, and installment land contracts for purchasing farmland. So what is a contract? A contract is a promise. Contracts basically specify and document the terms of an intended transaction between parties. But the difference between a simple old agreement and a contract is that a contract, the court system is one of those parties involved. And they will step in when asked to correct prohibited behavior or make remedy to an injured party. Contracts have five requirements to be legal and enforceable. The parties have to be legally able to enter into that contract. The contract must be for legal purposes. There must be an offer by a viable offer by one party. There must be an acceptance of that viable offer by the other party and consideration must be given. And that's just legalese for something of value has to change hands. If you want to know a little bit more of the legal ins and outs of contracts in general in agriculture, check out Mizzou Extension's publication aptly named Contracts in Agriculture. There's a link at the bottom of your screen. Now, you may be thinking about how onerous and intimidating contracts can be. Doesn't requiring a formal written agreement communicate a lack of trust? in the party with whom I'm doing business. Verbal agreements have sealed a deal with a handshake and all sorts of businesses for generations. That may be true, but I'm willing to bet that we don't know many of the stories about how those agreements fell apart, along with any relationships that went along with them. People's memories are short. And even if you do discuss all the possible contingencies before that proverbial handshake, how will everyone remember them? Will they remember them the same way? Even if they do, will they admit to it when their own interests are on the line somewhere down the road? Frankly, I think that going to the effort of negotiating a written contract is even stronger evidence to the fact that you value the relationship with a business partner and that you hope to create something that's mutually beneficial and a sustained endeavor by protecting both parties' interests. So let's talk about three kinds of contracts that beginning fruit and vegetable farmers are likely to encounter. In order of both duration and financial obligation, they are sales contracts, generally for the marketing of fresh farm products over a specified period of time, Land leases, used to secure access to land, equipment, infrastructure that someone else owns. And land installment contracts, sometimes called contracts for deed, which are basically owner-financed land transactions that may allow a beginning farmer to purchase land even when traditional mortgage channels are not accessible to them. Okay, so we're supposed to be talking about contracts, and here I am with the title of the slide that says sales agreements rather than contracts. Why is that? Well, like so many things, it has to do with money. If we're being honest with ourselves, it's pretty unlikely that we would take a chef or a retailer to court over a breach in contract over a produce delivery from a small-scale farm. 
it would cost more in time, effort, and legal fees than we were ever likely to recuperate from our estranged customer. So, more often than not, these things are going to stay sales agreements as opposed to contracts. But nonetheless, they lay out all the expectations of both parties in writing, and they lay the foundation for a transparent, communicative business relationship. The first part of a sales agreement details the basic terms of the transactions. It talks about what you are selling, how much, what quality or grade, what kind of packaging, how much it costs per unit. It also talks about exactly when you will deliver, how often, and for how long, when is the end of the contract. And finally, it details exactly how the customer should pay you and buy when. Do you want payment on delivery, by cash or check? Are you extending credit? It's something you have to decide. That was the easy part. The part of the sales agreement that takes a little more finesse is anticipating changes and contingencies. Stuff happens sometimes, and agreements have to change. Maybe a hailstorm kills all your Swiss chard, or your irrigation system goes on the fritz and floods your transplants. Or maybe it's just that the buyer can't sell as much kohlrabi as they thought they could. These things don't have to cause damage to your relationship if both parties know how and when the other must be contacted in order to make modifications to the agreement. Planning for some flexibility is simply a must. And in the case of persistent disputes, it may even be necessary for a plan for some mediation by a neutral third party. This process may take a little back and forth with your buyer, but simply knowing that your buyer is willing to go through this process and come to a mutual agreement is really kind of a good sign. If they won't, well, Maybe you're better off not having them as a customer anyway. Problem customers are often much more trouble than they're worth. Here are several really good resources on creating sales contracts. Farm Commons has a PDF on writing a basic sales agreement for the direct market farm, and it accompanies an archived webinar specifically on sales from direct market farms. FLAG, the Farmers Legal Action Group, has a document called Questions for Farmers to Ask Before Entering into a Direct Marketing Agreement, and Chapter 6 of the Legal Guide for Direct Farm Marketing by the Drake Ag Law Center has an introduction with 10 or 12 questions that Neil Hamilton wants you to ask before entering into a sales contract. Here is another area where the old handshake and a smile method was the accepted strategy for a very long time. But nowadays, if you're going to lease farmland, and especially if you're going to pursue farming practices with which the average agricultural landlord is going to be fairly unfamiliar, it's going to be wise to have a written lease. If your intended landlord has ever, <clears throat> ever rented to conventional farmers before, your lease is likely going to look a lot different from anything he or she has ever seen from tenants who raise corn and soybeans. Prepare for some time to get everyone familiar with what it is you intend to do. So why have a written lease? The reasons for having a land lease are much the same as the reasons as having a sales agreement or contract. With a written land lease, we're trying to create a record of exactly what was agreed to especially for those questions that arise years down the road when memories tend to be a little faded. For example, did we agree that you can host agritourism events on the property? We want to plan for potential changes and modifications to the lease that may happen down the road. For example, can I get access to more acres or more storage as the business grows? Are there limits to the amount of irrigation water I can use? Or can I harvest timber from the grove and build a shed or other building? Finally, we want to create a paper trail 
especially in case the landowner dies. Will the lease still attach to future landowners? It's an important consideration when leasing farmland, especially from an elderly landlord. So what exactly is in a farmland lease? Well, they range from very short with only a bare minimum of details to very long and very specific, detailing for everything from who retains mineral rights to what to do about lead-based paint. But at the bare minimum, all leases contain several basic sections. The first describes who is entering into the leasing agreement and describes the property that is being rented. This is followed by the general terms, including lease start and end dates, exactly how much rent will be paid, by what method, when, and any, uh, any allowances for fees or fines due to late payment or other, or other problem. It includes who will be paying for taxes, insurance, and sometimes even utilities. And includes how and when the lease may be terminated. For example, in writing by such and such a date or with X number of days notice. It may sound like that pretty much hits the high points, but your better leases still have quite a bit more to talk about. They will detail out exactly how a tenant can use the property. For example, is it just for agriculture or is any commercial pursuit allowable? What counts as agriculture if it's only for agriculture? Are there any chemicals or production practices that are specifically required or specifically forbidden? How much irrigation water can the tenant use? And if there's only a certain amount, how will it be measured? Who pays for liming the soil? Who pays to fix the fences? Is the tenant allowed to make improvements? And if so, how are she, is he or she compensated both during the lease and in the case of an early termination? As, as you can probably see, this can really get into the weeds. And speaking of which, who pays to control noxious weeds? The landlord will likely detail the rights they retain as well, such as why and when they are allowed to enter the property during the lease, how often they wish to communicate with their tenant about the property, exactly what information needs to be conveyed, and in what form. There are also crop share provisions in the case of a crop share arrangement, but I have to admit I have not yet heard of an Illinois farmland lease where the landlord wanted an interest in selling vegetable crops. If you want some more detail about farmland leases, both conventional and unconventional, here's a few great resources for you. The Ohio State University's extension system created a farm rental agreement checklist that has most of the bare bones basic that's going to go into a farmland lease. Also, Rachel Armstrong with Farm Commons put together a drafting a lease, questions for farmers and landowners to ask. It's a long list of great questions that ought to be considered before finalizing a leasing arrangement. Land for Good has a nice toolbox for leasing farmland. And finally, the Drake, Ag, Drake University Law School put together the Landowner's Guide to Sustainable Farm Leasing, part of their SALT, Sustainable Ag and Land Tenure Initiative. The last time of contract I want to discuss here is the land contract. It's also referred to as an installment land contract or a contract for deed. Often done between family members, the land contract is a sale between two private parties without involving any kind of mortgage or lending institution. Basically, the owner of the land retains a legal title, but he or she, in effect, finances the buyer, and the buyer takes possession and begins making monthly installment payments on the property. This transaction is documented by a contract, preferably drawn up by a qualified attorney, and this contract will lay out the terms and the duration. The buyer makes payments to the seller based on a negotiated interest rate, which is often lower than the market rate, and an assumed payoff period as long as 30 years. But in practice, the contract is often re-examined in 5 to 10 years 
when the buyer has built up the necessary credit and equity to purchase the property via a traditional mortgage instrument. So why would anyone do this? Well, buyers find this option attractive because it allows them to gain access to land that would otherwise have been financially out of reach, whether due to down payment requirements, inadequate credit, or some other factor that would prevent them from making it through the underwriting process for a traditional mortgage. Closing is fa fast and there's no third party closing costs, plus interest rates and down payment can often be substantially lower than the market rate, depending on the buyer's relationship with the seller and the seller's own financial situation. The other side of the coin for the buyer is that they do not take on full legal title to that property until the contract is paid in full. So that's sort of a risk. They take what is called equitable title, which basically means that they assume possession of the property and all the responsibilities that go with it, including paying taxes, maintaining insurance, and making repairs. However, if the buyer defaults, the seller can terminate the contract and retake possession of the property, with the buyer essentially forfeiting any payments or equity that they had built up. This is generally not the desired outcome when the contract is made, and states generally mandate that a buyer has 30 to 60 days to get back in good standing. But the option or the threat is always there nonetheless. This may sound like a pretty good deal for the buyer in a lot of ways, but it can certainly be a win-win for both buyer and seller. It depends on the financial situation of the seller. For instance, the seller gets steady income plus interest for the duration of the contract. If this is to be used as retirement income, it's even possible to put a clause in there that prohibits early payments in order to maintain the consistent income stream. Also, instead of having a large lump sum capital gains tax at the sale of the property, this tax liability is spread out over a longer period. Of course, this kind of arrangement is not without risks to the seller. Instead of the finality and closure provided by a typical mortgage land sale, the seller has ongoing responsibilities in a continued transaction with the worst case scenario being that the seller has to exercise their forfeiture option on a buyer who defaults. In which case, the seller gets land back that they have to try to sell again in what may very well be a very different marketplace several years down the road. If you'd like to learn more about land contracts, there's some great resources out there from many of the same uh, experts that I've been talking about previously. The Drake Ag Law Center has a quick brochure on insta installment sales contracts for beginning farmers that hits all the high points quite well. The Land Stewardship Project has an FAQ on contracts for deed, uh, part of their Farm Transitions Initiative. Um, UVM, the University of Vermont Extension's new farmer project has a page on land contracts. And finally, Farm Cobbins has a, a detailed webinar about financing a farmland purchase, legal basics for traditional and non-traditional farmland purchases. As usual, this introduction has only scratched the surface of three much larger areas of contracting which will certainly require further study when the situation arises in your farming career. But allow me to emphasize a few take home points about contracting that I'd really like to stick with you. One, a contract is a promise and promises in writing are more accurately remembered, remembered than promises that are not in writing. Our memories are fallible, and contracts that are longer in duration really ought to be documented for the odd situation that arises years from now when parties can't quite remember what they agreed to. Two, basic contract terms are fairly easy, but take your time planning for those contingencies. Contracts regularly require changes and modifications. 
Although it's probably impossible to think of every possible contingency, download templates, call on experts, seek legal counsel, be as thorough as possible in planning for a mutually agreeable contract modification process. You're going to need it. And three, although low dollar transaction terms can remain as agreements, those sales contracts we talked about earlier, seek legal counsel when you're talking about high dollar long duration contracts like those that detail access to land, either by lease or by purchase. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's going to be very beneficial to you to retain the services of an attorney when dealing with issues that have the potential for far-reaching legal and financial ramifications. So consult a lawyer before you sign on that dotted line. Here's the contact information to reach us via email. Please feel free to do so whenever you like. I hope this presentation on contracts was beneficial to you and short enough to keep your attention the whole time. We'll see you in class. Thanks, everyone.